OK, I think we will start the webinar and um, just firstly, I want to say thank you so much everyone for joining us today uh, on International Women's Day of all days. Um, and we are very lucky to be joined by uh, two consultant uh, obstetrician and gynecologists from King's College uh, with us today. Um, and we are going to discuss a very important topic on women's health, which is entitled what women need to know about menopause. Um, so firstly, I just want to introduce you to Dr. Marlon Mubarak, who is a consultant obstetrician and gynaecologist at King's College Hospital. Dr. Marlon has completed a postgraduate training at the Oxford uh, in UK. Uh, she also leads the endometriosis otis, sorry, um, I didn't pronounce that correctly, I will let you do that yourself, at King's College. And some of her areas of expertise are antenatal care and pregnancy, ovarian cysts, infertility and management of early stage of gynaecology colloidal cancer um, and Dr. Marlon will be presenting on premature menopause and premature ovarian failure and what we need to know. Um, so I think that was a little bit of a mouthful for me, Doctor, um, but I will let you um, take over from here. And also just to remind people, uh, we will have questions and answers at the very end. Uh, we also have Dr. Romain uh, going to present after Dr. Marlon. So we will leave the questions at the very end, uh, but thanks again for joining. Dr. Marlon, I'll leave it to you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you very much, Catherine. And uh, happy uh, Women's Day uh, to everybody. And what is very interesting this year, it's a uh, uh, year of equality. And I think if anything, COVID had shown how women are so unique, unequal with, with men. And in a way, to a certain extent, uh, you know, women have to work like three or four times as harder as men to be able to reach or to cut the mustard in a in a man's world. And part of of that or, or the effects of that, it affects our fertility and everything. My special expertise and interest is actually gyna cancer. I was the head of gyna cancer for eight years in the UK before coming here and advanced laparoscopic surgery for uh, endometriosis. And women with endometriosis suffer with premature ovarian failure and premature menopause. And I was trained in Oxford by one of the uh, experts in menopause, uh, Catherine Rees. And uh, hence, I have really this big interest in this topic. And it's really, really close to my heart. Premature ovarian failure is not actually premature menopause. Menopause is the definition of it is a woman not having a period for 12 months. However, premature ovarian failure is uh, something that happens before the onset of the menopause and it stops women from having uh, babies. So basically we as women are born with a certain number of follicles. We use these follicles along their life. Once we hit the age of 38, the number of follicles is low and they are old. They don't function equally well. Hence, the risk of miscarriage is increased and the risk of, uh, or the chances of pregnancy drops down. Premature menopause affects 1% of the women, which means uh, reaching the age of menopause period, stopping before the age of 45. Uh, premature ovarian failure, it affects 5% of the women between the age of 45 to 40. I think what is interesting, what I've seen since I came to the Dubai in the last four years, is the premature ovarian failure. The incidence is much higher than what expected. Hence, from my point of view, is the awareness because there is something we can do about that before the woman hit that, um, you know, period of her life. Uh, it's as early detection and there is measures that we can take. And that's why it is something really close to my heart. And that's why I decided to talk about premature menopause and premature ovarian failure. It's not just fertility that is affected. There is the health risk associated with these problems. The health risk associated with the premature menopause, uh, whether it's the risk of cardiovascular problems, the risk to, um, you know, 
early Alzheimer, uh, our memory, our general well-being, our skin, the vaginal dryness, and women um, having problem with repeated vaginal infection, repeated uh, urinary infection. Uh, these are all the problems that we see in women who have premature menopause uh, and premature ovarian failure. So what are the causes? What is very interesting, between 75 to 90 percent of women who reach the premature menopause, it's idiopathic as there is no reason whatsoever. There is other causes like uh, chromosomal abnormality, such as uh, X chromosome, fragile X chromosome, and the one name that pops into my head is uh, Nicole Kidman. She has fragile X syndrome. These women are very beautiful, tall, and they hit premature menopause uh, very early. The other cause of premature menopause is immunological, as the body attacks itself and diseases that have immunological background is like Hashimoto's disease, the thyroiditis, as well as uh, uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, so that's one other cause. The other cause is, you know, surgical. Unfortunately, you know, some women undergo surgery for cancer, they have their ovaries removed, or actually they need to have chemotherapy. And, you know, there is more and more children who are undergoing chemotherapy and cancer treatment at early age, which causes premature ovarian failure. Um, so this is, you know, the other group uh, of patients. The, what I see is the woman with endometriosis. Endometriosis affects 10% uh, of the female population. The chocolate cyst, which is the endometriotic cyst available yeah, present on the ovary, destroys the number of follicles that we have. In addition, unfortunately, having surgery to remove the cyst and being aggressive with the surgery can affect the ovarian reserve. And once we have loss of ovarian reserve, we don't regenerate uh, new follicles, new eggs, like men are lucky they have new group of sperms, uh, you know, uh, produced every 63 days. Women, we just basically live with, with that uh, number of follicles and we utilize them through our life. Uh, the other things which, we, you know, I'm sure you are all aware, the environmental factor and what we call is the aging factor, is the pollution effect on our eggs, the hormonal, uh, you know, pumped into the food that we eat, the pesticides, uh, the living, the lifestyle, the stress, all that affects uh, the ovarian reserve. So, um, so the question is, you know, what can I do? What do I need to know? Is it important? And as you can see from what I've just mentioned, it is important to know whether we are hitting uh, premature ovarian failure so we can have our baby when, uh, you know, we want to have before we lose that chance. Uh, you know, especially women, we are following our career, we delay having babies until the age of uh, 38, and suddenly, oops, the ovary reserve is not really good and our chances is decreased. I mean, one point to mention in the idiopathic group uh, of ovarian uh, failure, there is the genetic. It's good all, always to ask our mom how old was she when uh, her period stopped to make sure that we are well aware and well prepared. So there is tests that we can do to predict our fertility, uh, to predict our ovarian reserve. The simplest test is the FSH LH, which is a blood test that we do on day two, day three of the period. The FSH level, which is the follicular stimulating hormone, which basically produced by the pituitary gland to give a message to our ovaries to produce a follicle. Usually it's released uh, you know, at high level on day two, day three to promote the uh, production of the follicle. And it should be less than 10. Once it reaches eight and above, it means there is a compromise with ovarian reserve. 
However, this is not a very sensitive test. The most sensitive test for ovarian reserve is the anti-mullerian hormone. It's really the most sensitive test. It's called the AMH. Normally, we do the, the, the three hormones all together on day two, day three of the period. Our AMH should be more than 2.53 to say that actually uh, we have a good pool of follicles on our ovaries and we don't need to panic from the point of view of full ovarian reserve. Once it drops below one, the chances of pregnancy is extremely, extremely low. So, you know, this is a topic close to my heart because I see a lot of women who come and say, oops, nobody told me. I wish somebody had told me I would have done something about it. Hence, uh, here in Kings, one of the things I've created is a fertility checkup package to allow women to do their test. This test needs to be done on a yearly basis because our ovaries uh, are dynamic, they are a living organ, and things change. In addition to these hormonal checks, what we also can do is uh, an ultrasound on day four or five of the period, and we count the antral follicles. And they should be above eight, and that usually says we have a good ovarian reserve. So uh, there is other tests here. In theory, that we can do uh, if we hit the early menopause, the one thing uh, we can do is we do a chromosomal test. We take a full history to see if we can find any other causes that can cause uh, premature menopause and premature ovarian failure. The, the one thing that we need to mention is symptoms. Before our period stops completely, a lot of women, they start having a period coming every two to three months. Then six months later, their period regulates and then suddenly disappears again. And that's so typical of premature menopause and premature ovarian failure is, uh, you know, we have symptoms, they disappear, then, uh, then it's already, you know, the, the ovary fails completely. The other symptoms which we tend to have is the hot flushes, night sweats, mood swings, inability to eat, uh, inability to sleep, weight gain in the wrong uh, parts of uh, our body as, you know, the fat distribution, there is more in the, in the belly rather uh, than, you know, uh, all over the body the thinning of the hair, uh, the vaginal dryness, the painful intercourse are all symptoms of lack of estrogen, which we see well before the menopause hits, well before the periods uh, disappear. Hence, you know, if we want to delay our fertility because of work commitment, we're pursuing a career, um, that's the right thing to do. However, we need to be aware of our ovarian reserve and be aware of the things that we can do to uh, check that and make sure we are not uh, surprised. So, as I mentioned at the beginning, the risk of premature ovarian failure is really high. The risk of osteoporosis, uh, you know, it's the risk of uh, bone fractures, uh, the risk to our cardiovascular system. I'm sure we are all well aware, extremely, extremely rarely women would have a heart attack under the age of 50. But once they cross the age of 50, which is the natural age of menopause, they are more prone to have uh, heart problems, hypertension, diabetes and heart disease because the estrogen have a protective uh, effect to our heart. The other risk, as I mentioned, vaginal dryness, the recurrent vaginal infection, repeated vaginal uh, infections such as bacterial vaginosis, uh, repeated urinary tract infection, interstitial cystitis, where a woman have symptoms of water infection, however, the urinary test is not showing any infection, pain during intercourse due to vaginal dryness, decreased uh, 
interest in uh, intimacy, uh, all of these things really develop well ahead before uh, developing uh, of the, you know, the cessation of the periods uh, completely. So it's not doom and gloom, knowing is important. And I always say knowledge is power. Once we have the knowledge, then we know what we can do and how we can deal with it. Uh, not, it's not for all of us to have, uh, you know, not all of us want to have children. Some of us would rather to pursue a career and not to have children. However, uh, we don't want to be caught and be surprised when it's too late. Women nowadays are more aware of their options and we are more talking about openly about egg freezing and the technology is there for egg freezing or embryo freezing. What's the difference between egg freezing and embryo freezing? Egg freezing is usually mainly for women who don't have a partner but would like to freeze her eggs because her mom had premature menopause or she doesn't want to have a child, you know, uh, early on. So we collect the eggs, we freeze them. The embryo freezing is when a woman has a partner and basically uh, we uh, put the eggs and the sperm in a plate, they fertilize and then we freeze these embryos at the stage of, uh, you know, eight cells, uh, or something like that, and they can be freezed in, uh, for years and years, and we can use them whenever uh, we uh, need to do that. The technology, even in the UAE now, is licensed for women who don't have uh, a partner. While in the past, women had to be married to, uh, to freeze their eggs, and the technology is available now. And I have a lot of my endometriosis women. The problem with the endometriosis women, the ovarian reserve is really, really damaged by the chocolate cyst on the ovaries that damages the ovary and as well the surgery damages the ovary further. Endometriosis is an inflammatory disease that basically causes period pain and period pain is not normal. It also causes heavy periods, bleeding in between the period, bleeding uh, after intercourse, it has multiple presentations and, you know, I always say don't ignore pain, don't ignore abnormal bleeding, don't ignore irregular period, seek advice, you know, seek an expert uh, assessment, make sure that you have an ultrasound done, you have your hormonal uh, assays done uh, and you have a fully uh, check up. In addition to the, you know, freezing the eggs, you know, as like basically saving money in the bank, uh, that's the best way to look at it, is uh, we definitely need to treat women who reach the early menopause with hormone replacement treatment. The hormone replacement treatment is not something to be frightened from. It is, has a lot of advantages. So, uh, the American woman study really had given a bad reputation to the hormone replacement treatment. Unfortunately, it was a poorly designed study which showed increased risk of cancer, increased risk of heart disease and blood clots, and this study was flawed from the beginning. All the recent data showing estrogen is protective for the heart, especially if you are using it for women who are young, because what we are doing is we are replacing the normal hormonal uh, you know, produced by the ovaries. Uh, it just, they are not there and we, we are replacing them with, with a tablet or a gel or a vaginal tablet. The risk of breast cancer is extremely small and the best way to look at it, the risk of Breast cancer is 37 in 10,000 women if they never ever need hormone replacement. If they use the hormone replacement for five years, the 37 women will go up to 42. Uh, that's an extra five women. That's nothing in 10,000. If they use it for 10 years, it goes up by extra 10 women in 10,000. So the numbers are really small. 
but that risk does not really exist for women who are young. Uh, as I said, because we are replacing the natural uh, hormone, you know, the, the sad news is even with hormone replacement for women who reach the premenstrual menopause, we can't eliminate the complete risk of cardiovascular uh, problems. However, you know, we can decrease that risk by lifestyle changes, healthy eating, exercising, having regular checkups, having your pop smears, breast ultrasound, mammogram on a regular basis. And what is interesting, a recent study on the last couple of months published by the WHO showed that women who use HRT are at lower risk with breast cancer. Not they are at lower risk of developing breast cancer, it's actually we are picking up so early uh, their breast cancer because they have a regular checkup. We don't prescribe HRT, we don't see a woman. We check them every three months, we check their blood pressure, their weight, uh, we make sure they are up to date with all the screening tests, such as the pap smear and the mammogram. Hence, it's very protective. The other treatments, you know, for women with immunological problem causing uh, the premature menopause is corticosteroids and other uh, immunomodulators. It does not really uh, get them back to normal. However, it stops the deterioration of the ovarian function. Uh, so that is a really important uh, factor. To take into account and that's why it's important to diagnose. Uh, the other thing is um, uh, alternative supportive uh, treatment. And for premature menopause is of no value whatsoever. Uh, sorry about that, there is somebody knocking on the door. Uh, there is no value of uh, supportive treatment as an alternative to hormone replacement. Definitely, there is a value for taking multivitamins, for taking, making sure that uh, our vitamin D level is completely normal. We take vitamin D because, especially in this country, we don't see the sun. Uh, at the same time, for hot flushes, one of the things that can help us with hot flushes is a sage tablet. Uh, it really improves the hot flushes using paste tablet as supportive with vitamin B complex. Uh, so these are things that are of value as supportive, but not as of alternative uh, treatment. So the other really most recent uh, uh, advances in uh, premature ovarian failure, and definitely I'll have to mention it, it's stem cells. So what is the stem cells? The cells in our house or skin, it's called differentiated cells. The stem cells is the undifferentiated cells in our body. And basically they eventually differentiate into any type of cells in our body. The technology is very advanced in treatments for leukemia, certain cancers, and we collect the stem cells from the cold blood of the newborn baby, the cold itself, and the placenta, and we store them and freeze them. However, we have stem cells in our fat, in our bone marrow, which we can collect, harvest the stem cells, and uh, grow them in the lab and then inject them in different places. At the moment we are using it for uh, knee problems, our uh, joint problems. Technology is really, really still early. And the, the other uh, uses or potential uses is harvesting the stem cells from the fat and uh, injecting them in the ovaries to uh, help with premature ovarian failure. The technology is not yet 100%. There's some studies which uh, basically uh, showed 
potential benefit as 20% of the women, their period had come back and 10% got pregnant. But when you look at the data in detail, it's only uh, out of 120 women who the study, uh, they were included in the study, only 10 women qualified. Uh, and uh, out of these 10 women, one of them only got pregnant and the other one her period had come back. However, watch the space. This technology is progressing very quickly. Um, and this is one really uh, one of the uh, you know potential advances uh, for uh, for us uh, in the future. So, in summary, uh, if your period is normal, is irregular. Uh, you have heavy period, you have painful period, it is important to have a full checkup. Uh, on the other hand, if you are not have it, you're ready to have a baby at any point, you know, early in your life, any date you will be ready at age 35, 37, 38, uh, or even after that, it's worth considering uh, regularly having a fertility check and considering as well uh, egg freezing. So I kept my talk short and sweet because I would like to have questions at the end. Thank you very much. Dr. Marlon, thank you so much uh, for your presentation and for your very uh, informative um, uh, sharing of knowledge. I think when you said knowledge is power, that's that's very powerful. Um, and certainly you touched upon having regular checkups, which is so important for women. Um, but yeah, we will have questions at the very end. Um, so uh, if you are happy to stay with us, uh, Dr. Romana is going to share her screen um, and give her presentation. Um, so I'll just give Dr. Romana a second to share her screen. Um, and just, just a reminder for those um, who have joined, um, we will take questions at the very end. If you can just put them into the text box um, and then I will um, ask both doctors um, for their feedback. Um, so thank you so much. Uh, just to give you um, some background on Dr. Romana. Dr. Romana, thank you so much for joining us. Dr. Romana Hamid is a, a consultant, obstetrician and gynecologist with a special interest in maternal and fetal medicine with some special expertise in diabetes and pregnancies, women health and well-being and office gynaecology. Uh, Dr. Romana from London and uh, I believe recently has come to uh, the UAE the last three months. So you're very welcome to the UAE and hope you're uh, enjoying yourself so far. Uh, Dr. Romana also has over 25 years experience in her field. Um, Dr. Romana will present on what do women need to know about the menopause, some facts and myths. So again, Doctor, thank you so much for being with us. Um, I'll hand it over to you and then we'll leave the last 10 minutes for questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Catherine, uh, for a very warm uh, welcome and introduction to UN, UAE and the AS team, and especially for organizing this special event today to mark the International Women's Day. Um, yes, being relatively new to the UAE, it gives me a, an opportunity to share my experience having been trained in King's Hospital London and um, especially in the menopausal area to, as I said, to share my experience with you uh, on this platform. Now, the, um, as we said that today is the Women's International Day and it is a recognition of the fact that women's health is now becoming a global health priority. And uh, the theme of today's webinar, which is menopause, it further emphasizes the importance we are now placing on post reproductive health. It is important because uh, with changing uh, demographics um, and increasing life expectancy, we're seeing more women are now um, spending a third of their lifetime in the menopausal period, uh, which is now regarded as the midlife event rather than in the uh, aging group. So it is, as I said, it's a midlife event. And hence there is a pressing need that we need to address the women's health problems in this menopause or perimenopausal age group, uh, which occurs due to estrogen deficiency. And we address them, uh, especially if they're impacting on the quality of life. 
Now, thank you to Dr. Marlin. I think she has set the scene for me um, um, and making my uh, presentation, my work slightly easier. Uh, Dr. Marlin talked about the premenopause um, uh, and premature menopause uh, affecting approximately 1% of the women. So let's talk about what happens to the rest of the 99% of the women who enters menopause as a natural or you know, as a physiological part of their life progression. So my talk today will be focused on, yes, um, menopause, what women needs to know, um, and they will be, will be happy to take the questions uh, at towards the end. And this um, today's webinar is also in alignment with our value at King's, our philosophy and vision at King's, which is to share the information with you, which is based on scientific data, on clinical trials um, and on clinical expertise, what we call is evidence based practice. And as healthcare professionals, um, um, we would want to enable you so that you make the best decisions for yourself and what is the right treatment for you. As you know, there are, as you are going to see, there are lots of options of treatment which are present. So hence, um, as I said, the, the focus of my presentation would be on the information which is coming from uh, scientific data, evidence based, and as you see, to enable you to make what is the right or the best decision for you. And when we talk about the scientific data evidence based, um, uh, I just need to mention about uh, the two bodies, NICE, which is National Institute of Clinical and Health Research, and obviously our regulatory body, the Royal College of Obstetrician and Physicians, um, and which uh, most of the well re rehearsed research it is coming from these uh, regulatory bodies. And I'll be very happy to share um, them with you. Not forgetting uh, your patient choices and wishes because ultimately it is you. We are as healthcare professionals are happy to share the information with you, to guide you, to support you. But um, it is you who is going to make the decision based on the information given. So now coming to focusing on the subject, uh, menopause affects uh, women in all populations, right? And um, some of the questions which I'll be focusing um, would be, uh, are you able to share, see the slide? Uh, sorry, there won't be any. Yeah, so some of the things I've been focusing on would be that what is menopause and the perimenopausal uh, transition. What are the common symptoms? How do we make the diagnosis? When should I be seeking help? When should you be seeking um, uh, seeing the uh, your healthcare professional? What treatment options do I have? What choices I will be given? How does menopause affect my future health? What are the benefits and risks of different treatment, the pros and cons? And the, one of the most controversial topics we're going to touch on is the HRT. And the important thing is, is HRT suitable for me? If not, what are the different alternatives available? What are the different types of HRT? And um, towards the end of the presentation, we'll be very happy to um, share with you the, with some support uh, and network groups where you can find more information so that together we can you can make the, what is the best decision for you. So let's uh, come back to the um, first question, and that is how, what is menopause? How do we, making very simple terms, menopause is when you stop having your periods and when your ovaries stop making the hormones or there's a gradual decline in your hormone, which is called the estrogen. Now, the usual age group, it happens between 45 to 55 years. Um, in UK, the average age for menopause is uh, 51 years. And I was trying to Google some data from UAE, and it is slightly earlier in UAE population, around 49 to 50 years. I will not touch upon the early menopause, which Dr. Marlin has already covered very nicely. Then um, the menopause, usually it's a gradual transition. So your periods may start getting lighter, less frequent and irregular over a period of several months or even years. And this period is known as the perimenopausal period. This, there can be a sudden or abrupt changes in your menstrual cycle, stopping of the period. It can happen um, through a surgical treatment if you have undergone removal of ovaries, which is called oophorectomy, 
or removal of your uterus or womb, which is a procedure called hysterectomy. Uh, women may end up having um, menopausal if uh, <clears throat> secondary to any medical treatment, um, for example, having chemotherapy or radiotherapy for different malignancies. But we are going to touch more on the um, natural physiological uh, causes of the menopause. Um, <clears throat> so having come to, let's um, we've talked about the diagnosis. It's basically based on your age group, as I mentioned, based on your symptoms. And um, what are the symptoms? Some of these have been covered already, but just to take you quickly. Yes, these are very common symptoms of menopause, but remember that uh, the women, uh, different women will have different experiences and they all will not be affected by the same um, um, symptoms, okay? Some may have milder symptoms, not requiring any treatment. So in some, it may be just short-lived, brief symptoms, which may respond to just vaginal estrogen creams, while in some women, it can be distressing, um, impacting the quality of life. And these are the women who would be a most suitable candidate for the HRT. So as my colleague mentioned about some of these symptoms of hot flushes, night sweats, basically they're all related to this one common thing and factor, and this is because of reduction or deficiency of estrogen levels. So you can see vaginal dryness, lack of sexual uh, desire, dysuria, frequency, incontinence, um, part of urinary tract infections, loss of memory, lack of concentration, mood swings, anxiety, irritability, joint and muscle pains. So these are more commonly uh, recognized as the symptoms in the menopause. Now the second question come to make this diagnosis, do you need any blood test? And the answer is uh, most of the times you don't, depending on what age you are having these symptoms. Yes, if you're having the menopausal symptoms at age less than 40 years, yeah, that is the premature ovarian insufficiency, you would definitely require a blood test. In fact, the, to be repeated in four to eight weeks time. If you're having, you may be offered the test if your age group between 40 to 45 years, and if you are 45 to 50, then the diagnosis is usually based on your symptoms. And what test we are talking about? It is FSH or follicular stimulating hormone and um, the levels of which they go up in your menopausal period. So that is about the diagnosis. Now, having moved in forward, now your next question would be that uh, uh, what treatment options and choices I have? Now we have, if you can see, there's a plethora of treatments available and I've tried to uh, classify them into some starting from very basic, which is the lifestyle changes, um, hormonal, non-hormonal and complementary therapies. And I'm going to touch base on um, on the, taking you briefly through it, we'll not be able to cover um, in depth um, the, as it, you know, it, it will take about the whole day we can talk about on menopause, but starting from the basics, the lifestyle changes, these are important and they should not be restricted just to the menopausal age group, okay? We as a women, we should be responsible for taking care of our health and we will be focusing on health promotion and prevention rather than treatment. And that is the RC, uh, the, that has been our COG logo these days. So what lifestyle changes we are talking about? Simple, we start with um, regular exercises because we know physical activities that reduces the incidences of hot flushes and night sweats. Regular exercises, it uh, help improve your sleep, boosts your mood if you have irritability, anxiety. Um, so exercise, regular exercises is good uh, in maintaining a healthy lifestyle, bone mass, and what exercise, and especially we talk about is the weight bearing exercises. So driving, swimming, not driving, running, swimming, and some relaxation techniques like yoga. Focusing on um, healthy and balanced diet, um, the two, again, to preserve your bone health, taking vitamin D, calcium, um, and most importantly, avoiding s smoking, caffeine, alcohol, spicy food. Not only these are shown to trigger the 
hot flushes um, and night sweats in the menopausal women, uh, but they're also they're important and independent risk factors for other health uh, diseases, for example, heart diseases, diabetes, hypertension. So it's good that we start taking care of our health by avoiding the triggering factors. Then you can um, help yourself by um, reducing the stress levels. Easy for me to say, but especially having gone through the COVID, we have seen um, some of us as healthcare professionals seen a lot of stressful uh, women who have been presenting to us have gone through a lot of stresses. But we can um, try to re reduce stresses by improving the amount of uh, sleep, exercise, and you know, take plenty of uh, good food, a healthy food, balanced diet. And lastly, um, wearing loose clothes at night, sleeping in cool ventilated rooms, all these are uh, helpful lifestyle measures. And I said that you should not be restricted only towards your, to control your menopausal symptoms, but they should be a part of your life as a part of health promotion. I will touch on the non-hormonal treatments. We have we have the choices, non-hormonal. There are medicines and there are prescription drugs available uh, for women who are not suitable for the hormonal replacement therapy. Um, example, uh, clonidine, not going into the details. They do tend to be effective um, in reducing the hot flushes, but slightly less than the HRT. Then we have um, psychological treatment, which is known as the cognitive behavioral therapy, and that helps uh, uh, people to change, you know, how they feel, how they think. And it is an important component of um, um, improving your lifestyle changes and your, to help your menopausal symptoms. Then there are non-prescription medicines, and if you visit a health shop, you will find a plethora of these medicines, and these are also known as complementary uh, or herbal remedies. Uh, some of them, we have the scientific evidence to uh, prove that they are safe um, and efficacious, but for many, we don't, we lack the data. They're unregulated, they're not licensed, and hence, um, it is important for your healthcare professional to um, explain to you, as I said, and for you to ask your health professionals when you, they are prescribing you, what is the quality of the medicines they are giving you? What are the ingredients present? Um, what is this? Always ask uh, three questions. The safety of that medicines, whether it has been proven through the clinical trials, whether they are effective in controlling the symptoms, and most importantly, do they interact with other medicines? That is also very important. Uh, so when we talk about the complementary therapies, I just want to mention St. John's Wort, we have isoflavones, primrose oil. So some of them, I said, they do have the scientific evidence that they are effective in controlling the symptoms, but not all. Then we have bioidentical compounds. Now, as the name suggests, they have been marketed as identical to the natural hormones and to the standard HRT therapy, but these are unregulated products and therefore they are not recommended um, because there's a lot of uncertainties regarding their safety and their efficacy. So, as I said, there are lots of treatment and choices available and we have to make informed choices means based on their risk profile, based on the pros and cons of the treatment. We have to decide, you have to decide what is the best option for you. Now let's uh, come on to the HRT, which I'll be focusing more as a hormonal replacement uh, therapy. Um, and uh, the many women which we see in uh, during the consultations and uh, there have been controversies about the HRT of um, um, some of you might be aware based on the different clinical trials, the famous WHI Women's Health Initiative study, which was commenced in the United States and had to be terminated prematurely because the data found that the women, they were at increased risk of cardiovascular diseases and it became unethical to continue the uh, the, uh, ours, the randomized controlled trials. Some of this information also is coming from the observational studies, but the long term studies, which I'm going to share the results with you uh, later. So before we have commenced on HRT, when women, they come to the um, uh, during consultation, they ask us, doctor, is this HRT suitable for me? And a very relevant question. I think each one of you who are attending 
you seeing your healthcare professional should be asking these questions. And one of the um, uh, um, reason for these webinars is to educate our uh, population of women so that they know what are the right questions to ask to address to the healthcare professionals so to decide what is best for them. So first, yes, if HRT is suitable for me, and if uh, not, what other alternatives do I have? I have shed some light on the alternatives. Um, now I'm going to talk more and focus more on the HRT suitable for you. So then we move forward and some of these questions. As I said that. Uh, <clears throat> let's start with <clears throat> and I'm coming back to my slide here. So I've covered um, gradually we'll taking you through. So here we're covering this. What are the different types of HRT? which are available and what are the benefits and risks of this treatment? So let's say what types of HRT are available. HRT is a hormonal replacement therapy. We have two main types of hormones in the therapy and the estrogens and progestogens. Um, progestogens are important because they protect the lining of the womb to, and they to interfere with the unopposed effects of the estrogens. Estrogens, they cause thickening of the lining of the womb and that can lead to irregular vaginal bleedings that can lead to problems like um, um, uh, cancers of the endometrium. And that's why second hormone or progesterone is added. So that is the rationale behind the having the second hormone. So as I said, there are two types. Um, what type of HRT is suitable for you will depend upon your age, basically whether you are in the perimenopausal age group or you are clearly menopausal, which means you had the last period a year ago. It will obviously depend upon what symptoms you are having, which we have already discussed. Some of the symptoms like hot flushes and night sweats, which are known as a vasomotor symptoms, or if you're having vaginal dryness, urinary symptoms or lack of sexual desire, which are known as the urogenital uh, symptoms. Um, it will also depend most importantly, do you have a uterus or a womb? So if you have a uterus, um, which majority of the women will, then you need to have a combination of estrogens and progesterone HRT for the reason I just mentioned um, that progesterone is protective. And if you don't have a womb, you had a hysterectomy, then uh, estrogen only therapy is suffice. Then this is this is these are important things which you need to ask your healthcare professionals. Then what are the when let's say um, what types the other different types of HRT they, they can be given by different routes. Let's say address that first. They can be given as tablets. You can take them orally. If you're not a suitable candidate for tablets, then you can take them or you don't like to take the tablets. You can take it through non oral routes in the form of the patches, which you can stick on the skin and they can be changed every um, twice weekly. Um, so you don't, there's no need to take them daily. There are gels available and then there are vaginal estrogens which come in the form of the creams and rings and pessaries. So we have different types. We have different routes and uh, then they can be given through different regimen plans like uh, <clears throat> for example, there are the two types of uh, plans by which you can have these hormones. <clears throat> you can either have them as a sequential or cyclical HRT, which means that you will have a withdrawal bleed uh, when you're taking this, these hormones. These are ideal for women who are in the perimenopausal age group and um, they're having their cycles, still having their periods, and we synchronize these cycles with the cyclical HRT. The women who are clearly postmenopausal, they would benefit more from a continuous combined HRT, which is also known as the period free or no bleed HRT. So these are the things which we need to consider when we are prescribing you. Uh, and this comes uh, through your consultation through proper assessment. And then what are the uh, benefits and risks? Now benefits are we've touched upon. We've talked about the symptoms. Yes, HRT is uh, the most common indication for prescribing HRT is addressing your hot flushes and uh, night sweats, the menopausal symptoms. 
Um, <clears throat> it also improves your bone health, the condition called osteoporosis, because uh, there is thinning of the bone, reduction in the bone mass, which makes you more vulnerable to osteoporosis or fragility of bones leading to fractures. Um, the role of dementia on Alzheimer's, it's still uncertain. The evidence is, um, is still lacking on it, and, but there, there, some suggest that yes, it has, uh, estrogens have a clear role in improving the cognitive functions. Now, the risks are important of the age of HRT, and as my colleague has also touched upon that, and this is one area which I would suggest if there's a take home message is that um, you sh the risks of HRT. Now, th th there's a lot of controversies about it. As I mentioned, it came from the previous science data um, and it made the healthcare professionals and even the women, they were reluctant to take it. But what is important, there, there is no medicine which is without a risk. But what is important is, yes, there is a risk with hormone replacement therapy. But remember, these risks are very small and the benefits usually outweigh the risks. That is important. Uh, these risks depend upon the type of HRT you are taking, the dose which you are taking, the route through which you are taking. And very importantly, again, the risk depends upon your underlying risks. So yes, if you have a history of breast cancer, then maybe HRT may not be the best suitable um, option treatment for you. Yes, if you have or um, if you have the risk of having blood clots or VTE, then maybe it may not be. It is not totally contraindicated, but it may not be the best suitable option for you. But that doesn't mean that there is a full stop. There are other better options. We can change the dose. We can change the route. We know the HRT, which is taken orally, it has increased risk um, be uh, because of the metabolic pathway it has to go through. And so the HRT, which is given through the transdermal route, that is, which is the patches, the gels, because the systemic absorption is minimal. So that uh, better choices uh, in terms of reduction of the risk. So when I'm talking about the risks, yes, yeah, so what risks you are at for um, slightly increased risk. One is um, increases the risk of having blood clots uh, in the legs or in the lungs and that condition called venous thromboembolism. And again, I said the risk is high. If your previous risk is high, if you've had a previous history of uh, blood clots, or if you have other risk factors for the blood clots, you're obese, you have uh, immobilization, surgical risks, and the risks are higher with tablets. So you can still consider having the HRT in the form of patches or the gels. The risk of heart diseases and stroke. And they have been enough data to suggest that if you start HRT before the age of 60, then the risk is very small for having heart diseases and stroke. There is no increased risk of dying from uh, cardiovascular or heart diseases if you are on the HRT. And um, the ta again, having said so, the tablets may put you at an increased risk, but patches and gels may have a reduced risk. If you already are at increased risk of cardiovascular diseases and maybe because of your other predisposing factors, for example, you have hypertension, you have diabetes, you are obese, then all these we have, have to be factored into the equation whether you are a suitable candidate for HRT or not. But coming back to even if the risk is there, it is a small risk. Risk of breast cancer, there is a small risk. Again, the risk is very small in terms of medical terms, in terms of statistical terms. The risk is there if you're taking combined HRT, estrogens and progesterones both. The risk is slightly increased if you take it for a longer period of time. And it does go down when you stop the HRT. So these are the th things or the facts which we need to be Clear, which need to be educate you, um, our women and share with you the information, as I said, based on the scientific data. There are lots of myths, misunderstandings, long held beliefs, and the um, advantage of these webinars is that we can address them through the, these uh, through this platform. Now, uh, how quickly will HRT improve my symptoms? I've been you know, taking these questions during the consultations when women come and they ask these questions. And um, so yes, the HRT, first of all, you can start HRT at any time. 
uh, within the perimenopausal or the menopausal age group, depending upon your symptoms. Um, yes, you should be told, you should be expected to um, um, have some side effects because these are hormones, estrogens and progesterones. And what side effects? You may have, they cause fluid retention, so you may have bloating, you may have breast tenderness, some muscle cramps, nausea, irregular vaginal bleeding, a very common side effect of when you being started on the hormonal replacement therapy. Uh, because you know they're synchronizing with your cycles if you're already having them and usually we advise that you continue the treatment for three to six months and when the bleeding continues then we uh, um, go for more further assessment obviously depending upon your prior risks. The side effects are usually um, transient, they resolve themselves um, and if they don't then we they tend to advise you to take your HRT with food to minimize lower the dose um, or we change and always change the type and the route of the hormonal replacement therapy but we always it's good to start with the lowest effective dose and then you gradually increase that. Uh, it takes about uh, two to four weeks time for the effects of the hormones to kick in and to feel uh, symptomatic relief. Um, about how when many women ask when should you stop HRT now they can be stopped at any time but it's good and makes, makes common sense that uh, if you they're stopped gradually uh, uh, they can be stopped suddenly but then obviously your symptoms may come back. Um, can I still become pregnant on HRT is one of the common questions also comes up and the answer is HRT is not a contraception so and uh, the recommendation is that uh, if you, uh, you are age 50 or below then you should be using a contraception for two years and above 50 at least for a year to avoid any unwanted pregnancies. Um, so yes you can still become pregnant on HRT and uh, how and when do I start HRT and when should I stop? I think I've already covered that. So these are most of the, I think, some common um, uh, questions which I've tried to focus through my slides. Coming back to my earlier slides, um, we have covered this. Now, how would menopause affect my future health? So we've talked about its effect. Estrogens are protective or for the heart, for the bones. Um, yeah, and so you are at increased risk, slightly of osteoporosis. But remember, this increased risk is also a part of your aging process and your prior risk is very important. Benefits and treatments, we have talked about it and I think I've covered most of this and where I can find more support and information available, that's important. So what we have discussed today, what we have shared with you today, as I said, is based on scientific evidence, clinical trials, and I would like to signpost you to these different websites and uh, which will help you. Um, you can go through, there's a lot of information there, but um, ask questions where, from your healthcare professionals uh, so that they should work with you and they should give you the information um, and together you should make a decision which is best for you. So thank you. Dr. Romana uh, and Dr. Marling, thank you very much. Um, Dr. Romana, that was very, very informative. And I think uh, even just listening to both of you um, talk, um, it's great to actually have these discussions uh, that are very open. Can you hear me OK? Yeah. Um, these yeah, discussions yeah. that are very open, um, educational and informative and, and certainly breaking down the myths around menopause, um, you know, it's, 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 it's been fantastic. Um, I like that you touched upon reducing stress because I think, you know, stress has a, a massive impact on, on all of us um, and particularly for women uh, to manage their own health and take responsibility. You know, a lot of women tend to look after everybody else and they're the caregiver and and, um, you know, so it's seldom that women will take time to uh, to put themselves first and take care of themselves. So I appreciate you both being here with us today. Um, I think actually you've covered any of the questions that have come in. Um, you've both touched upon um, by answering those questions. Um, so I'm also conscious of time. Um, it's just gone after two now. So um, again, thanks so much for being with us. Um, and happy International Women's Day to everybody. 
Thank you. Thank you. Take care, everybody.